Well, welcome to all of you. Back at the beginning of the century, an Indian saint made a very interesting prophecy. He was visiting America. His name was Swami Ramatirtha. And he said that someday you Americans will take this science of yoga and make it practical and bring it back to my people. And when I was in India lecturing about 20 years ago, and there were crowds of 2,000 at a time coming to the talks, they reminded me of this and said that they felt that this prophecy was being fulfilled. Um, Today I was going to talk to you uh, on the subject of yoga in the West, the role of yoga in the West, and I feel that we have to understand that we have something to add to this science of yoga, not in the sense of improving it, but rather in the sense of making it understandable to the people of this day and age. There are two ways of approaching the subject of yoga and of Indian teachings here in in the West. and One is to teach it from a standpoint of using all foreign words, all foreign concepts, including in it the entire sort of mystique of incense and robes and long hair and everything that goes with the Indian mood. And the other way has tended too much in the other direction, I think, and that is to teach it from a standpoint of, well, we want to make it totally American. We want to leave out all Indian words. We want to use it in the context of what we are accustomed to seeking in in the West. So we find that yoga is often taught primarily from a standpoint of just physical benefits, slimming your hips or whatever it might be, um, in a purely physical sense. And there are a lot of teachers that I've talked to in different parts of the West who tell me they don't dare teach more for fear that they would lose students. Um, I think somewhere between these two is the real role of yoga in the West, that there are certain words which we might as well just keep because they, we don't have any comparable words. You talk of the ira and the pingala and the kundalini and so on, what are you going to say? There isn't anything in, in our language that remotely corresponds to them. You can talk of the sympathetic nervous system, but that doesn't even really do it, apart from the fact that it doesn't inspire any kind of spiritual in- interest. It refers strictly to the body, where when we speak of the ira and the pingala, there are physical counterparts of these currents, but we're really talking of currents in the astral body. And what do you do with that in English? Um, Even words that we know are words that we use differently. For example, the very word meditation, we don't actually have a word to correspond with the concept of meditation in, in India. What we have are words that are approximate. When you meditate on something, really, you think about it. You dwell on um, various aspects of it. You think around it. But when you meditate, according to the Indian concept, you don't think at all. Um, There are different kinds of meditation that are used for helping a person to grow spiritually. Meditation's not just on a problem, but, for example, in the Catholic Church, they use meditations to like the meditations of St. Ignatius of Loyola, which are their techniques, their visualizations. And through those visualizations, you transcend, hopefully transcend thought, ultimately go into a higher state of consciousness. So meditation can be used either in the mundane sense of just thinking about your problems or in the spiritual sense of thinking (coughs) or visualizing things that lift you upward But nonetheless, meditation in our Western terminology means exactly the opposite in this sense from uh, opposite of what the yogic concept of dhyana is really all about. We have to transcend thought if we are going to attain that state. Well, we don't have a word, but we have something approximate enough for all 
yogis, there isn't an exception that I know of to have used the word meditate, but in a new way. In a sense, what we're really doing is redefining some of our terms rather than bringing in new terms. And I think that's valid. I think that, that uh, we've, that's the process of a language's development anyway. But the more that we can use our own words, the more that we can use our own concepts. Interestingly enough, Yogananda, when he started out in this country, wore his hair long in the streets and wore a robe, and, and uh, he was walking down the streets of Boston one day, and uh, a group of factory girls on their lunch break were following him, giggling. Finally, one of them got the nerve up to pull his hair, and uh, he turned around and had a little chat with them about how you, you should not laugh at somebody just because his customs are different. And for a time he tried to educate the Americans in the Indian way, but he saw that that, that wasn't working, and he had to be selective if he was really going to get across what he wanted to. In fact, the message that they were getting was that if you want to practice what he was teaching, then you've got to wear a robe and get your hair long and preferably go and live in a cave in India. And all those exotic things, uh, to us they're exotic, to them they aren't. I remember living in India, seeing an article in a Madras newspaper mentioning those exotic American ideas. And to them we're exotic. But at any rate, they are exotic to us, the, the things that that uh, are a part of their sort of cultural accoutrements. And so what Yogananda did, and I feel that it was a very valid direction for the teaching of yoga in general here in the West, was not to try to Indianize, but to try to spiritualize uh, the West and America particularly. And he took to wearing a suit, even uh, in his own hermitage. He would wear a robe when he gave services, but otherwise he dressed in normal Western garb. He wanted to give people the message that what I'm teaching you, you can practice. Well, what I've observed in a lifetime just about by now of traveling around the world and teaching these things has been a corroboration of what he and others have said that the West basically has an external orientation. The East has an internal orientation.